Free food. Free food is always fine. So how many people turned their homework in by email? And did anyone do it by hard copy? One, two, three, okay. What did you send? Four. Ricardo raised his hand both times. No. <laughs> I guess we have none of our comrades from Los Alamos today. <coughs> Okay, so we've talked about graph coloring, we've talked about planar coloring, um, we've talked about the interesting fact that for three colors, telling whether a planar graph can be colored with three colors is just as hard as an unrestricted graph because of that crossover gadget. For us, for four colors, it's, the answer is always yes. We also talked about how, um, I mean, in the planar case, the answer is always yes. And <clears throat> we also talked about the fact that, um, so here's graph, K coloring. So we talked about how for two colors, this problem is solvable in polynomial time. We didn't quite talk about, uh, well, okay, so, so we gave a polynomial time algorithm and almost a proof that it works. The algorithm was grab a vertex, color it black, now color all its neighbors white, now color all their neighbors black, and so on. And if you can get through the entire graph, 
um, without any contradiction, without any pair of neighboring vertices of the same color, then clearly it is too colorable. You just need to prove the if and only if. And I claim that's not too hard. Um, so for two colors, telling whether, uh, for k equals two, telling whether you can color a graph with k colors is in P. Um, but for k greater than or equal to three, it seems to be hard. And, uh, well, I know that I can't really maintain too much suspense here. But it will turn out that for three or more colors, this problem is NP complete. OK? This is kind of interesting, and we'll come back to this. What's the difference between two colors and three colors that makes it, uh, makes three colors hard, but two colors easy? <coughs> um, but maybe you can tell me. Why, why should telling whether a graph is two colorable or not be so much easier than telling whether it's three colorable or not? Because it's once your neighbor is, I mean, color, you kind of determine. No ch choices. Yes, for two colors, if your neighbor is black, you have to be white and vice versa. Whereas for three colors, yeah, you have two kinds of choices. Whereas for three colors, you have some choices. I mean, you know, if, you, if, if the colors are red, blue, and green, and you have a red neighbor, you can be blue or green. So you have to make a choice of one or the other. Um, certainly, once you have two neighbors or more colored, then maybe you're restricted. But at least at so, in some parts of this process, you have choices. And um, well, that means that you sort of have to do this exponentially branching search, like some kind of backtracking search. <coughs> let's try coloring this one blue and see what happens. If we hit, hit a contradiction, let's come back and try coloring it green instead. So at least the straightforward kind of the straightforward search algorithm would seem to take something like k to the minus 1 to the n time, right? Because once one of your neighbors is colored, you have up to k minus 1 choices. So it would, it's, just, it's less than this, but as a really rough, rough estimate, we could say it's roughly this. If k is greater than 2, this grows exponentially. If k is only um, 2, then this is 1 to the n. Of course, we really mean it's this times a polynomial because we have to actually get through the whole graph. You would have a question. So, um, all right. So now uh, let's look at k sat. So k sat, you know, we talked about how sat in general or some people call it CNF sat, for, again, for conjunctive normal form. Sat in general, the input is a CNF formula. So it's a series of clauses <coughs> where each clause is the or of a set of literals. And each literal is either a variable or its negation. <coughs> and so on. Uh, Ksat is the specific case where there are exactly k variables per clause. So 3sat is the most famous, and there are exactly three variables per clause. And um, OK, good. <clears throat> well, again, it turns out that for k equals 2, this is in p. Um, it's not exactly the same as this 2 is not quite the same as that 2. Uh, but uh, well, let's, let's talk about why this is. So um, uh, OK, so having gone through so much work to write out this silly example in the book, I think I, I, deserve, to, I deserve to use it. Um, OK, so <clears throat> let's call our three variables P, Q, and R. Uh, I'm planning a dinner party. P stands for pomard, which is a nice red wine from the Burgundy region of France, which goes very well with birds. Q 
stands for quail, a bird, smaller than a chicken, very tasty. And R stands for Roquefort, which is a blue cheese. Okay. So now I have various constraints on what I can have at this uh, at this party. So let's see. Um, dum -da -da. So first of all, it would be it would be crazy to serve the bird without such a nice wine, which goes so well with birds. Um, so what that means is that uh, I wouldn't want to serve. It, it, it means that I should either serve the wine or not serve the bird, right? This is the same as saying that if I, if I do serve the quail, yeah. then I must also serve the wine, OK? Right? So it's also true that the, the blue cheese, the Roquefort, it's kind of stinky, and it would really overwhelm the wine. So I shouldn't serve both of them. So I should give up on the wine or on the cheese. OK? Then again, I'm, I'm really hankering for either the quail or the cheese. I just, you know, I, I, I must have, I simply must have one of them tonight. And then uh, finally, I know that my co-author really wants to have either the proverb or the quail. OK. So the question is, can I satisfy all of these constraints? And, and, if, and what are the truth values? So um, we talked last time about the fact that whenever you have uh, a statement of the form A or B, this is the same as saying that if A is false, B must be true. And if B is false, then A must be true. OK, so in the propositional calculus and formal logic, these, you know, this pair of implications really is exactly the same as this or. Keep in mind this is not an exclusive or. It's perfectly OK if both A and B are true. Okay. But if one is false, the other one must be true. So um, the idea is to translate this uh, set of clauses into a set of implications. And I can do that like a graph. So I'm going to have, for each variable, I'm going to have a pair of vertices which correspond to setting that variable true or false. And now each implication is going to be an arrow in this graph. <coughs> So this says, if p is false, then q must be false, right? Okay. But it also says, if q is true, then p must be true. So each one of these corresponds to a pair of arrows. They kind of go in opposite directions, but also they affect opposite, you know, vertices corresponding to opposite truth values. This says that if p is true, then r must be false. This says if R is true, then P must be false. This says if Q is false, then R is true. And if R is false, then Q is true. This says if P is false, then Q is true. And if Q is false, then P is true. All right, so this is a map of, you know, you, you can start out um, in any place in this graph, but this is a map of where the where these logical implications force you to go. And so let's see let's see what happens. So if I started here, for instance, if R is false, then Q must be true, and then P must be true, and P says R must be false. All right, that's okay, good. So that's a consistent set of things. On the other hand, let's see if I start over here. Um, if R is true, then P must be false. But then Q must be true. But then P must be true. But then R must be false. This isn't a contradiction. It just means R can't be true. 
Okay. Right. Well, actually, you can see that R is true, then P is false. And from P, there's two R's to Q, one to false Q or one to true Q. Yes. That, yes, and you're right. That's also a problem. Yeah. Because then R being true would imply two contradictory things. Um, that's true. But I, I claim that, the, you know, whenever that's true, that there'll also be a loop of things leading back to R being false because of the way these arrows come in pairs. <clears throat> All right. So R must be false, because if we try to set it to be true, we get a contradiction, and, and moreover, we get things forcing it to be false. But setting it to be false, that seems to be safe, stable. Um, I think setting it to be false doesn't lead us to forcing it to be true. So let's try setting P to be true, Q to be true, and R to be false. The claim is that this is a satisfying assignment. And indeed, this is true. This is satisfied because P is true. This is satisfied because R is false. This is satisfied because Q is true. This is satisfied by both of them. Okay? So each one of these constraints is satisfied by one or both of its literals. Good. So now, um, <coughs> let's add a further constraint. It turns out that my cat is very fond of quail. And if I serve the quail, if I don't also serve the Roquefort, the cat also likes Roquefort, then the cat will eat my friend's quail. <laughs> so that means that I must either give up on the quail or serve the cheese to distract the cat from the quail. And now, if Q is true, then R is true. And if R is false, then Q is false. Now I claim I really have a problem. Because if I set R to be true, same then problem. by the same thing path we had before, it must be false. But now if I set it to be false, by this new path, it must be true. So now R is forced to be true if it's false, and forced to be false if it's true. This is a contradiction. It can't be either. And now there are no more satisfying assignments. So by adding that one additional constraint, the formula has gone from satisfiable to unsatisfiable. OK? So I claim that um, I claim the following. So convert a two sat formula phi into a graph G with so if phi has two has n variables, let G have two n vertices and set up the edges on it in this way. Okay. So for each variable x sub i, I have two vertices, one corresponding it to be true and the other corresponding to it being false. Then theorem, phi is satisfiable if and only if there is no variable x sub i with paths, directed paths, from x to i, from x sub i to x to not x sub i, and back again in this directed graph G. Okay. So I claim that, you know, in, in one direction this proof is easy. I, if there is such a variable that has these implications, then clearly there's a contradiction inherent in the system. And there's no way to satisfy all the clauses. What I haven't quite proved is that if there is no such variable, if there isn't a contradictory loop from x to not x and back again, that the formula is satisfiable. We haven't quite proved that direction. Again, let's prove it algorithmically by describing an algorithm which, which searches 
for, uh, you know, for satisfying assignments, and which succeeds in setting every variable as long as there are no loops of this kind. Well, we've actually kind of already talked about that algorithm. So <clears throat> it's, it's going to be unit propagation. It's going to be a little bit of backtracking search with unit propagation. So here's the algorithm. Um, start with any variable. Okay. There are several possibilities. So if there is a path from xi to xi false, then what should I do? What should I, how should I set it? Set it false. Set it false. Um, if there is a path in the reverse direction, set it true. If there are both paths, give up. Yeah. What should I do if, if neither of those paths exist? Try one. <laughs> Actually, I claim if neither of those paths exist, I can do whatever I want. Uh -huh. I claim that in that case, there's actually more than one satisfying assignment, and I can set this variable to be true or false. Okay? So if, if both give up, if neither, do as you will. Okay, set it to either one, and I claim that either one will lead to a satisfying assignment. <clears throat> so, how do we tell if there is a path? DFS. Sorry? Yes, you can, but in this class, let's say it's reachability. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, mm -hmm. let's not worry about how we, you know, what, the details of how we solve reachability, but we know we can. So we can tell whether these paths exist because this is a reachability problem in a directed graph. The directed graph is clearly easy to construct in polynomial time as a function of the, of the formula, the size of the formula. It's a very simple reduction from, from uh, two set to uh, not one reachability problem, but a, a bunch of them, mm -hmm. a set of reachability problems. Okay. So, the other thing I want to point out is that what happens when I say, you know, A or B, and then I have these edges from not A to B and not B to A, what am I saying really if, if you're here, then we'll go here? Well, this is what we called unit propagation last time, right? Mm -hmm. This says that if I have, if I set A to be false, then this clause is becomes shortened to a one variable clause, also known as a unit clause, which now demands that B is true. Okay? And so by iterating this process, everything's fine as long as I never get a unit clause which circles back and causes another unit clause which contradicts it. And that's this loop that we're worried about. Okay. So you know, there, so I, I, I claim that that this algorithm will succeed in finding a satisfying assignment, um, as long as there are never both of these loops. I'm not sure that we've proved that exactly. In fact, I don't think we have. I don't think this is a proof yet. It's, it's still just a claim. But <clears throat> so um, 
and I don't really want to take the time today to go through a formal proof. But the argument is, is, is this. Just take the variables. Let's take them in order, x1, x2, x3, x4, x5. Okay? So I claim as long as you follow these rules, once you set x, let's say that there's a path from x1 to not x1. So we set x1 false. Okay? So I claim that x1 will never cause us trouble ever again. Okay. Um, but now we also have to look at what unit clauses X now forces us to, to have. So, um, so we need to add one more statement, which is that, so let's say that we've already set X1. We now have a formula which might have some unit clauses in it as well as some two variable clauses. Okay? Mm -hmm. So um, if xi appears in a unit clause, then satisfy that unit clause. Give that unit clause what it demands. Okay? So we don't actually, if we, if we do this much look ahead, we don't actually have to do any backtracking at all. And that's the big difference between two set and three set. With two set, we can, we can predict whether setting this variable true or false will cause us any trouble down the road just by looking at these paths of implications. Right. I mean, you decide. Do you want to see the proof that this algorithm will work if there are no such loops? Yeah. Not getting a whole lot of enthusiasm here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, it's in the book. It's in the okay. book. And and basically the idea is that let's say setting x i leads to, uh, and, and this came up in our example. Let's say that it would lead to two contradictory unit clauses. Okay. This would be that. Yeah. But remember that these arrows appear in pairs. Okay. So remember that, for instance, every time Q being true, Q being true forces P to be true, P being false forces Q being false. So I claim that if these two paths exist, then there are two partner paths like this, which would lead back to x sub i being false, in which case we would not have set x i to be true in the first place by this rule. OK? All right. <clears throat> so, uh, so again, k sat for k equal two is solvable in polynomial time. For k greater than or equal to three, we think it's very hard. And there's something a bit like the two coloring versus three coloring. With two colors, once your neighbor is colored, you have no choice. It's it's a deterministic process. Here, in the same way, you know, you basically have to deterministically follow these arrows to see what their consequences are. There are a few times when you have choices, when you can do one or the other, but when you have that choice, you can do either one, and neither one will cause you any trouble. Okay? So you don't ever have to backtrack. It's, it, it's never the case in 2SAT that you set most of the variables, satisfy most of the clauses, but then you hit a contradiction and you have to undo a lot of your work and backtrack a long way and try again, and this keeps happening and you have to explore this exponentially large search tree. Okay, with two set, that doesn't happen. With three set, you might think, well, isn't there some similar thing maybe having to do with a 
hypergraph. A hypergraph is just something where you have sets of, say, you know, just like an edge is a pair of vertices. A hypergraph is something with little groups of, say, three vertices. Um, and uh, can't we do something similar? So let's say that I have a three set clause which says I want A or B or C. Well, the problem is that this, it, it doesn't seem to be easy to boil this down in the same way. So if A is false, then it's true that I have to set B or C true. But I don't know which one, and this causes a search algorithm to have to branch. It can try one or the other. Either one might lead to various consequences. It's also true that if A and B are both false, then C must be true. But this is a sort of, you know, this looks a bit like chemistry. Now I have to have two things on the left in order to have this consequence on the right. Okay. Um, whereas in two set, I have one thing on the left and one thing on the right. So I just need to follow these chains of implications. With three set, things really seem to be a kind of a branching, webby mess of constraints. And as far as we know, it takes exponential time to explore the possible ways to satisfy everything. All right. Good. Uh, questions or comments about KSAT? Yes. Uh, is there a direct reduction from the graph two coloring problem to the distance two set problem? A direct polynomial time reduction? Uh, not only is there, but if I'm smart, I put it in as an exercise. <laughs> so, to so find uh, find a reduction of this form, or as we often write it, a reduction like this. Okay. <clears throat> but why has to be two? Why can't it be more general K? Is well, you could reduce it to three set, but then you'd be reducing it to a more general problem, right? So if you're going to convert one problem into another, you'd like to convert it into a problem which is as easy and as specific as possible. Does that make sense? I'm asking, why can't you reduce k coloring to k set? Is it the same oh. method as you? If well, actually, I, can, I claim that for any k, you can reduce k coloring to three set. We actually talked about that at the end of last time as an exercise. And this is interesting, right? This all, if you believe this, this already tells you that 2SAT, I mean, think of 2SAT as a, as a logical language. Think of a 2SAT problem as trying to express a set of constraints. So what this says is that if I give you a language in which each one of your constraints is the or of just two variables, it's a powerful enough language to describe two coloring. But I claim it is not it does not seem to be a powerful enough language to talk about three coloring. If you can convert three coloring to a two sat formula, well then, uh, you would win a million dollars and uh, you know all the theorists would chase you out of town because you'd, you'd have just shown that P and NP are the same. Because this will turn out to be NP complete, but this is NP. But 3SAT is a powerful enough logical language to talk about 3-coloring, 4-coloring, 5-coloring, any number of colors. So do this. These are very good exercises to do. And if you don't do them yourself, I'll assign them on the next homework. <laughs> so, um, because the point is that 3SAT is really a very powerful and general way to force certain things to be true about a certain set of variables, whether those variables are colors or Booleans or any number of other things. OK? So do you know what I'm asking you to do, even if you don't see it how to do it? 
I'm asking you to take any graph and show me how to convert it into a three-set formula where the number of clauses and variables is, you know, polynomial in the number of vertices and edges of the graph, such that the three-set formula is satisfiable if and only if the graph is three-colorable. Okay, so any other questions or comments about SAT? So just as with graph k-coloring, we can talk about the general problem SAT where k can be anything, um, or we can talk about the specific problem 2SAT, 3SAT, 4SAT, and so on. Um, uh, oh, here's one other thing I do want to show you. So I claim that k sat for any k can be reduced to 3 sat. Okay? Which is actually a good place to go next because again I'm I'm claiming that 3 sat is already extremely general. One particular it's general enough so that you don't actually need four or five or more variables per clause. 3 sat is already enough to capture all of those to express them. So how do we do that? Well, let's say that I have a clause, let's say it has five variables. I want to break this up somehow into three variable clauses. But I'm allowed to create new variables if I want. Okay? I mean, I'm trying to reduce, let's say I'm trying to reduce a five sat formula to a preset formula. Okay. So in that reduction, it's, you know, I can do anything I want as long as the total number of clauses and variables I have in the three-set formula is polynomial in the number of variables and clauses I had in the five-set formula before. Okay. But I'm free to create new, it's just like, remember, in, in, our, in our planar three-coloring, we made a bigger graph with more vertices by replacing each crossing with this little gadget. Remember that? Mm -hmm. So you're allowed to modify the problem. Okay, that's fine. All right, well, look at this. I claim this equals the following. X1 or X2 or Y and not Y or X3 or Z and not Z or X4 or X5. I claim that you can satisfy this if and only if you can satisfy all three of these. Okay, so obviously what I'm doing is I'm breaking this into pieces and then I'm using these new dummy variables as the links in the chain to hold it all together. So let's, let's work this out. I mean, this is worth going through. So first of all, um, let's say that, uh, let's prove that if this is satisfied, then I can satisfy this. Well, let's say x1 or x2 is true. Well, then this is satisfied. But let's say that all the other x's are false. So how do I satisfy these two? Dummy variable. I'm going to play with the dummy variables. So for instance, let's say x2 is true and all the others are false. <coughs> so this clause is taken care of. How do I take care of the other two? Y should be false. Yes, I'll set y to be false and z to be true. I'm oh, sorry, z to be false. Yeah. And z to be false, yes. So now all three clauses are satisfied. Similarly, if it's x3 which is true, I can set y to be true and take care of that one. And again, z to be false to take care of this one. And finally, you know, blah, blah, blah. So but by adjusting these dummy variables, I can use them to satisfy all the other clauses. Conversely, 
let's prove that if these three are all satisfied, then this is satisfied. In other words, let's prove that if all three of these are satisfied, it forces at least one of the x's to be true. Well, we just need to make sure that we can't use the dummy variables to satisfy all of these clauses, that we have to use one of the x's for at least one of them. Well, let's try. I mean, of course. If, 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 the, if the x's are false, z here has to be false, which means one of these things y. has to be true. If x is true, then y has to be false, which means, OK, we forced our way to that end, and now we have to use one of the two x's. All right? So for any k, you can break k sat clauses up into three sat clauses. And again, I'm going to say it again. The point is that three set is very powerful in general. It can express a lot of different kinds of constraints. It is simply not the case that to express fancier and fancier constraints, you need more and more variables. Three is already enough. Can you break this all the way down to two set clauses? No. I don't see how. <laughs> but, I mean, it's worth struggling with a bit. I mean, intuitively, we kind of need three variables per clause because Choices. we have the original variable, and somehow we have to link it to other ones, and you need two links, and so that's three. But this isn't a proof. Mm -hmm. So it's worth pondering a little bit. And indeed, um, I claim that you can't break it down to two sat clauses, and that if you could, then P and NP would be the same. Okay? Because if because two sat is NP. And as we will see, three sat is NP complete. Even we haven't proved that yet, but we will soon. Okay, good. So three sat is general enough to express nearly anything. Um, all right, so any more, any other comments about SAT? So, okay. So let's go on and talk a lot about a few other classic problems in NP. So here's one called subset sum. Okay. So the input S is um, a set of integers, positive integers. Let's say that there are L of them. Um, and actually let's let's start out with a slightly different, a slightly more special problem called integer partitioning. Partitioning. So the question is, is there a subset uh, A such that the sum of all the things in A equals the sum of all the things not in A. Okay? So think of it this way. Uh, your uncle has given you a set of brass weights. You want to display them on the mantelpiece. So you have a little scale, an old-fashioned scale with two pans. You want to put some of the weights on this side and some of the weights on that side so that it balances. Well, this doesn't sound so hard, but you know there are two to the L potential subsets. I mean, including the empty set and all of them, which are neither of which are seem to be a good idea. But even not counting those, there's an exponential number of possible subsets. And notice also that these numbers are um, not necessarily small. Okay. So, for instance, notice that if n is the total number of bits uh, 
in the description of the problem, so in this set, then, for instance, it could be that I have square root of n numbers in the set and that each weight is a um, square root of n bit number. Okay? I mean, you can imagine, so you, if the total number of bits here is n, you can imagine sort of two extremes. I could have a very small number of numbers, each of which has many bits of accuracy, corresponding to, you know, it's a large integer. Or I could have, um, uh, at the other extreme, each one of these could be very small, and I could have n of them. But in between, I could have root n of them, and each one of them could have uh, um, root n bits. Do you understand this? Remember, I mean, the size of a problem is the total number of bits it takes to specify it. So to send you this, I'm going to send you the bit sequence or digit sequence, if you prefer to think in base 10, which is fine with me because it's all in the big O. You know, the digits of this, a comma, the digits of that, a comma, the digits of that, a comma, and so on. Okay. So there can be a lot of these numbers, which means there could be exponentially many subsets. And the numbers themselves could be exponentially, could have exponentially many digits. Um, so there's another version of this problem called subset sum. In this one, in addition to giving you uh, the input, um, I give you an integer t. And now I ask, is there a subset A whose total is t? Okay, so now I give you a specific target. So now you know there's a knickknack also on the mantelpiece. It weighs t. And now I want to find a set of grass weights that balance that weight. Okay, so obviously this is true, right? Why is that? What am I saying? Yeah, so you can always change integer partitioning into an example of subset sum by setting t to be half the total of all the weights. It's slightly trickier to prove this. So I claim that given any instance of subset sum with any set of weights and any target weight t, there's a way to add one more weight so that now it becomes a, a balancing problem, an integer partitioning problem. Okay? So that's a nice exercise. All right, so here's something else I'm going to say, <clears throat> which is that um, let's see. So here's a claim. These problems are in P if the total weight is only polynomially large. Okay, so think about what that means. Again, if I gave you three weights, and this one had n over three bits, and this one had n over three bits, and this one over, had n over three bits, then each of them is about two to the n over three in size. Mm -hmm. Right? So those are large numbers, exponentially large numbers. So this is talking about this other extreme, where I give you lots of numbers and each one is very small. Okay, so how many bits does each of the XIs have if this is the case?
How many bits does it take to write out a number which is polynomial in n? Log of this. Yeah, order log n. Right? You are computer scientists. You should know this. So, um, so if 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 my description of the problem, if each one of these <coughs> integers is only log n bits long, then that means that the corresponding integer is only polynomial. And if I have, you know, roughly n of these, I have at most n. I mean, I guess it could be n over log n or something. Who cares? Then the sum of all of them is at most n times 2 to the log n, which is polynomial. OK? Good. So, um, and I claim the proof is by dynamic programming. So some of you have already seen this in a different form, which is that similar problems involving integers and adding integers and packing integers, a lot of problems like this are in P if the integers are fairly small by dynamic programming, like knapsack. Okay. So does anyone care to explain the dynamic programming algorithm that works in this case? So the idea is to write down a function f um, that uh, f of t, which is 1 if there exists a subset A whose sum is t, and 0 if not. OK? OK, well, now we do the same thing we always do in dynamic programming, which is we make our first choice, and then we see what subproblems result. So let's define, let me define a fancier version of this, of this function. <clears throat> let's say that f of i comma t is 1 if there is an A um, starting with the ith thing in the list and going up to n, whose total is t, and 0 if not, if there exists such an A. OK? What I'm interested in is what I really want is f of 1 comma t, because then the subset can be taken from the entire list. Mm -hmm. Well, now tell me recursively, what is f of i comma t in terms of a subproblem? What choice does this represent? Take, in, uh, take the i1. I either include x sub i. Or I don't. So if I do, what do I have left to do? Uh, plus one, but you have the right idea. So if I include x sub i, then I need a subset of the remaining things, ranging from i plus one to n, whose total is what? The value of minus x sub i. Or I don't include x sub i, and then what do I need to do? i minus 1, still t. Uh, i plus I 1. i plus 1, t. Still t. Right. Okay. okay. Now tell me why this condition matters to this dynamic programming algorithm working in polynomial time. You have to, I mean, okay. Oh. from. F one T. How many different subproblems are there? If if my initial problem, I my initial problem is say, F one comma capital T over two, where capital T is the sum of all of these because I'm trying to solve integer partitioning. So what are all the subproblems that I'm going to end up being interested in when I recursively apply this formula? I L times all the summations. Uh, 
I mean, I'm going to be interested in f of i comma t for which i and which t, potentially. Yeah. i from 1 all the way up to to l. Yeah, so I, I will range from 1 to l. Sorry, I should have been l. And what about t? t is 0 to from t to 0. Yeah, it ranges from 0 all the way up to so all the summations. Yeah. The original yeah. thing, the original t I asked about. And so the number of different subproblems that I need to solve is, is order l times t. Yeah. Well, l is at most n, where n is the size of the input. That's you know no problem. But if t is exponentially large, I need to solve an exponential number of different subproblems. Okay. But if t is only polynomial, polynomial time. Okay. So you know you do need to get comfortable with this interplay between a little n digit number is an exponentially large number, like two to the little n. And so it matters, you know, and then a log n digit number is one which is polynomial. So sometimes, this is not a word that I use very much, but some people call this sort of thing pseudo-polynomial. I, I, I don't think this is a very good term, but the idea is that, you know, when you have numbers that involve integers, um, <clears throat> then you can say that the problem is pseudo-polynomial if the values of these integers are only polynomial, which is very different from saying that they have a polynomial number of digits. Okay. okay. So actually, if you remember, remember our discussion of max flow, and we had the Ford-Fulkerson algorithm. So we talked about, well, the Ford-Fulkerson Ford algorithm increases the flow by at least one unit each time it improves. This means that if the total capacities are only polynomial, well then, after a polynomial number of steps, it'll find the maximal flow. But in the input to the problem, if I describe a flow network to you, I could give you capacities which are exponentially large, which have roughly n digits. In that case, it's not obvious that the Ford-Fulkerson algorithm works in polynomial time, and you have to improve it, for instance, by always using the shortest path, like we talked about in the homework, um, or, well, like I told you to look at in the homework. Um, OK. So again, this, so is it clear this problem is in NP? What is the witness? What is the proof if the answer is yes? The partition. The size of the size of the partition. The size? Uh, the partition itself. Yeah, the, the subset. Itself. I just show it to you. I show which things to include. You add them up. You say, ah, oh, yes, that works. Mm -hmm. okay. So again, the witness is the, is the thing that we're positing it exists, or we're asking if it exists. Um, and this restriction of it is in polynomial time. But in general, no one knows how to solve it in polynomial time. And guess what? Yes, it will also turn out to be NP-complete. Um, all righty. So. Um, Let's take one more. Uh, well, let's, let's take another nice example of a problem in NP, which we've already seen in the homework. Uh, although I'm going to look at a simpler version of it here. And there are actually three problems which are so tightly related that they might as well be the same. <coughs> so. input a graph and an integer k. Here are three questions. Clique, is there a set of k vertices forming a complete graph? In other words, all pairs of these k vertices are connected to each other. 
Okay. So if this is the graph of friendships at a party, is there a set of K people that are all friends with each other? <clears throat> Independent set. Is there a set of K vertices such that no two of them are connected? So now we're asking, is there a set of K people who are total strangers? None of them know any of the others. Finally, vertex cover. Is there a set of K vertices? Um, I'll call this set S. Such that for every edge in the graph, at least one of its endpoints is in the set. Okay? <clears throat> so, for instance, if this is our graph, then here's a vertex cover. I could take this vertex, this vertex, and this vertex. Now every edge has at least one of its two endpoints in the vertex cover. Okay? And these three form a clique. And this and this are independent. Okay? So I claim that these three problems are so easy to reduce to each other that they might as well be the same problem. Okay. So let's define G bar, the complement of G, as a graph uh, which has the same set of vertices as G, but has the opposite set of edges. Okay, so two vertices are connected in G bar, if only if they're not connected in G. So in this case, I guess, the edges of G bar would look like this. Uh, is that all of them? Yep. Um, OK. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, if S is a clique in G, <coughs> Tell me something involving an independent set. Give it a name. Complement. G bar is G bar. Uh, sorry, can you say the whole sentence? If S is a clique in G, then? Um, S is an independent set in G bar. Yes. S is independent. An independent set in G bar. Is that clear? Okay, so right, you know, if, if I have a set S and everybody's connected to everybody else and I flip all the edges so that now you were connected, if and only if you weren't, and vice versa, now none of these people are connected to each other. And another nice fact is that if S is an independent set in G, then tell me something about S's complement. So again, uh, an independent set is one where no two things are in the set are connected. Mm -hmm. But this also means that if I look at any edge, I, I can't have both ends in the set. At least one of them is not in the set. And that means that S bar is a vertex cover. A vertex cover. Also in G. 
Okay. <clears throat> so, um, now, this gives us some maximization and minimization problems. So, what we usually say is, <clears throat> what is the size of the biggest clique? If you want the optimization problem instead of the decision problem. What's the size of the biggest clique? What's the largest K such that there exists a clique of size K? Or um, independent set. Independent set is like trying to fit people in who conflict with their neighbors, right? So it's like asking, what's, what's the largest number of things I can fit in this set without bumping into each other? So what's the largest independent set on a square grid? Weighted independent set. Yeah, yeah. Just, just right? you know. Because I mean, there the interesting thing about the problem was that each vertex had a weight, and yeah. I was trying to achieve the total weight. Here we're just looking at the number of them. Just they all have equal weight. Half of them. What, what is that? Like a checkerboard. Yeah. Like like this is this is an independent set, and so is this. Yep. Okay. So. So. Um, Okay, uh, and then a vertex cover, some people like this metaphor. It's sort of a strange metaphor, but it, it's like there's an art museum, and there are corridors in the art museum, and the intersections are vertices. And you want to make sure that for every corridor, there is a guard at one end or the other. Um, so we need to make sure there's a guard here or here or both. And then that's like a vertex cover because it's saying that this edge, at least one of its two endpoints has to be in the set. Okay? So in the case of a vertex cover, well, one vertex cover is cover everybody. <laughs> but the goal is to find the smallest vertex cover. Okay? So, and since the complement of an independent set is a vertex cover, finding the smallest vertex cover is exactly like finding the largest independent set. So um, obviously these are all in NP because once again the proof is show me the set. It's easy to check that it is a clique or that it is independent or that it is a vertex cover and that its size equals K. And um, so uh, <clears throat> when I first learned about clique, I was surprised that it was a hard problem. Are you surprised clique is a hard problem? You don't have to say yes just because I thought that. I mean, how hard is it to tell if there's a triangle, for instance? A triangle is a clique of three vertices. Each is connected to the other two. Is that hard? How long does that take in a graph of n vertices? Let me find all the, all the triangles. DFS for every vertex. Yes. Big O of n cubed, right? I mean, try all triples. Oh, I you know, I mean, yeah. we don't need to do anything fancy. Just go through all triples. You said n choose three, but yeah. That, you know, so go through all sets of size three, and for each one, check to see if all three edges are there. So that sounds fine, but then again, what about four things? Well, now it seems like it might take order n to the fourth time. Uh, and then, you know, so the problem is that as these cliques get bigger, there get to be higher and higher powers of n involved, at least if we solve this in the most obvious way. Um, there are smarter algorithms, but, but it, it seems like the problem might be getting harder. You might also imagine, though, that can't we build cliques in a kind of incremental way? I mean, first find a triangle. <clears throat> and then look around for somebody who's connected to all three of these. And then look around for somebody who's connected to all four of these. And this sounds okay, 
Why doesn't this solve the problem in polynomial time, finding the largest clique? It's cost more and more. Well, it doesn't cost so much. I mean, if I have a new person, it only takes me at most n time, right? If the current size of the clique is k, I only need to ask k questions to see if all of these edges exist. Mm -hmm. So, and there's only n new vertices I could consider adding. So it seems like each stage of this process only takes polynomial time. And <laughs> it takes at most n stages to get to however many people I can get to. So that's just another factor of n. It's still polynomial. So why doesn't this solve the problem in polynomial time? Uh, I mean, it's possible. I mean, if you start at the wrong, <clears throat> wrong triangle. Uh, that's true. OK, but there's only at most n cubed <laughs> possible triangles. So I'll give you another three factors of n. I mean, Try it with all triangles and see where each one takes you. I mean, you have many. Oh, I see. So. I mean, this is a greedy algorithm. Mm -hmm. What could go wrong with a greedy algorithm? Yeah. <clears throat> so what could go wrong here? So, I mean, let's say that I've found a triangle. And I promise you, this triangle is one of the triangles in the largest clique. <laughs> then when we found next vertex, which connects to okay, all vertex. So it's not necessarily the but then second vertex, you need to find that it also connects to not only to triangle, but to that just found vertex. Well, I mean, the problem is so it could be that this is connected to all three and that this is also connected to all but three. They don't connect. And that they don't connect to each other. Yes. And it could be that if we follow this path, that this will lead to the biggest clique. But it could be that the biggest clique does not include this. Mm -hmm. And it could be that it includes this instead. So there are choices here. Yeah. There are choices about which thing to add to the clique. And we could go wrong. Could be that this leads to a clique of size 47,006, and this leads to one of 47,009. And we're not going to know that for a long time. And we would have to explore. And of course, there's a similar set of choices at the next step and so on. And the problem so I mean, it's, it's, important. it's important to learn to perceive things like this in the structure of the problem, you know, to realize that you could go wrong, and you could be forced to backtrack. Sorry, what were you going to say? I was going to say that I mean, can the problem break down in a, in a certain, I mean, just with some set of roughs, like uh, I'm, just, I'm just throwing this thing around them. If, if it's a Peterson graph or something like that, Sapolinsky triangle. I mean, get, I mean, could this problem break down and could it be amenable to, to attack by a dynamic programming algorithm if it's a special kind of graph? Absolutely. I mean, you know, anytime you restrict the question was could this be amenable to dynamic programming or other strategies when if we restrict to some special type of graph? And the answer is yes. I mean, in particular, if a graph is planar, what's the biggest clique you can have? How big a clique can you have in a planar graph? Three, four. 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 four, four, four. You can have this, but that's the biggest clique you can have in a planar graph. OK, so for planar graphs, this problem is pretty easy. What is before I try? Oh, yeah. You know, just check to see if you have any of these, and if you don't, if you have any triangles, and if you don't, you know. An edge is always a clique of size two. So, I mean, you, it's restricting to a special class of graphs always has the potential to make a problem easier, because there may be algorithmic strategies that work for those graphs that don't work for graphs in general. What's kind of more fun is that, in some cases, it doesn't make it any easier, like for three coloring when we restrict, when we restrict to the planar case. It's kind of surprising at first. That doesn't make the problem any easier. Um, so anyway, 
All right, well, this is a good place to stop. I, I would appreciate it very much if you would read chapter four, if you haven't already, um, now that you're done with the homework. <clears throat> and um, I think what we'll do in, uh, what we'll do next time is section 4.4, which talks about knots, and it talks about the question of if I show you a curve in three-dimensional space, and now I claim to you that this curve can be untied and made into a simple loop, is that problem in NP? What is NP for me? Well, I mean, is it in the same class NP that we've been talking about? Okay. You know, so in other words, if the answer is yes, is there a simple proof that the answer is yes? Well, what would the proof be? Oh, like the steps you need to do to untie the knot. That's a good idea. So it could be the sequence of steps that you would use to untie the knot. But what if that sequence is very long? There is actually no proof currently. This is an open question. If I show you a picture of a knot with crossings like this, where each crossing shows you, you know, which way is an overpass and which way is an underpass. Okay. And if there are n crossings, if it can be untied, can it be untied with only a polynomial number of moves? Amazingly enough, this is not known. Um, I think it's probably true, but no one's been able to prove this. And in particular, you might be surprised to learn that there are actually cases where you need to temporarily increase the number of crossings in the picture, okay? which is a little bit scary, because we don't know how much you might need to increase it. And it it's, it's conceivable, although it seems very unlikely, that in order to get from this thing from with n crossings to a simple loop, you have to first go through something really snarled with a whole lot of crossings. If that's true, and if the number of moves you need to make is in some cases exponentially long as a function of n, this problem might not be in NP. But there might be other kinds of proofs, more mysterious, topological proofs which establish that this can be untied, which are a little bit less direct than a sequence of moves that unties it. So we'll talk about that. We won't do the topology. I don't know how to do it myself. But we'll sketch that. It turns out that this problem is in NP, even though we don't know a polynomial upper bound on the number of moves you need to untie a knot. And we'll talk a little bit about primes, and after that we'll do NP completeness.
Actually, that's hard. Well, what? You, you, hard. you want to meet for... Reading in chapter? Oh, really? Yeah. So, <laughs> I don't, think I don't know. I, don't know. Yeah. I got some other homework to deal with. Same thing when, when we talk about the homework. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, we can discuss about it. Are you that cool? Ah, outside. Took that one. Homework? No. Is when, here this? When, when, when he'll give the next homework, then we can, while discussing the homework, we can also discuss what's. Yeah, and the chapter. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's right. Did you receive an email from the guy about the yeah. 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 guy? Yeah, and the guy said he can make, he cannot make it on, he cannot make it on, uh, on, on uh, Fridays, but he prefers to make it on Wednesdays. Actually, Wednesday is my longest day, so. I don't think even we have to decide. I don't think even like meeting in the middle of the week is a good idea. I don't know. Right now it depends on what schedule fits everyone. So we'll see. Yeah. So even he cannot attend this Friday meeting. Yeah. This Friday won't do anything much. Won't you meet? This Friday.